Hello everyone. I'm uh, Raghu Bhatt, uh, principal engineer at the, uh, Cisco, working on uh, Cisco Open HDN controller. So today uh, we'll be giving kind of a high-level overview uh, of the APIs that are available in Open HDN controller, both REST APIs and a little bit about the Java APIs. So, uh, so here is the agenda. So a little bit about the introduction. What is OpenHDN controller, and uh, how is it different? A uh, little bit about the model-driven APIs. As you will see that OpenHDN controller is a little different in the, how the APIs are generated and how they are made available. Uh, and kind of a quick overview of the type of APIs available in uh, OpenHDN controller. How do you get the inventory of the devices connected to the controller? How do you get the topology information? Suppose you want to do your own uh, rendering, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, we'll delve a little bit deeper into the OpenFlow APIs in particular. There are more APIs available, which we cannot get through all of them. But, um, and I'll be showing a quick uh, demo as well. OK, so what is uh, Cisco Open HDN controller? It is a Cisco's commercial distribution of open daylight. It is a hardened distribution made uh, you know, ready to run in production. But at an API level, it is 100% compatible with open daylight. So any application that's built for uh, open daylight is expected to run on open HDN controller as well. That's kind of very important to us. So the differentiations are more in the packaging, how the serviceability works. Like, for example, uh, you can very easily, with a cl single click, you can deploy it in a cluster. You can get all the log information, metrics information into a central dashboard, et cetera. But as far as the APIs are concerned, they are the same. Same applications will work. Uh, so as of April 30th, uh, OpenHDN controller is available uh, in uh, limited availability. And you can uh, try it out in the DevNet sandbox as well. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the uh, Open Daylight, this shows the high-level architecture of uh, Open Daylight. It's a multi-layer architecture, kind of starting from the bottom. Of course, you have the, all the network elements, Cisco or other third-party uh, devices. And above that, in OpenHDN controller, you have a set of southbound plugins which uh, typically for each uh, protocol as supported by the network uh, element. So Open Daylight comes with the uh, OpenFlow, NetConf, OVHDB, uh, so like uh, BGP, PSEP, et cetera, so many different uh, southbound protocol plugins. And at the layer above that are set of core uh, services, like I was mentioning earlier, inventory and topology, for example. So these are core services irrespective of the applications you want to build on top. Then you might have specific services. So for example, uh, say service function chaining is a service available in open daylight as a separate project, but you can easily build uh, service function chains or uh, group policy or authentication, et cetera. So these are some of the additional services which come bundled with open daylight which provide a REST API on top of which you can build uh, your applications. So Open Daylight being uh, open source, you can innovate at any of these levels. You could be building an application using the REST API, or you could be for a little more maybe an advanced use case for performance, et cetera. You could be extending Open Daylight itself and write an additional network service. Or let's say you want to integrate with a custom protocol, you could be writing a uh, custom southbound plugin as well. So today we'll be focusing mostly on the REST APIs. Um, as you might have, uh, be familiar, or maybe not, uh, Open Daylight is a model-driven system. What does that mean? What that means is that all the APIs and the interfaces 
are automatically generated from a high-level description. So for example, uh, let's say you want to describe the inventory, and you could describe what the inventory data model looks like using uh, Yang, which is a high-level modeling language. And from that, the system automatically generates the REST API. It can generate a NetConf API, or it can generate a Java API, et cetera. So this makes the maintenance and enhancement of the system very, very easy. So like I mentioned, um, uh, Open Daylight uses uh, Yang as the modeling language. And there are over 100 different uh, Yang models in the system. You probably don't need to get you know all of them. But it's important to understand, once you look at a Yang model, how that might result in the uh, REST API, et cetera, so that you can easily figure out, say, for example, for a given REST API, what uh, payload you might use, et cetera. And we'll be covering a little bit of that. So RESTConf. RESTConf, like, I mean, it's an automatically generated API. So that's where it might be different uh, from uh, the other kind of REST API documentation you have seen. It, uh, since it gets auto-generated, you can, once you see the pattern, how it gets generated, you'll be able to figure out most of the APIs. So uh, <clears throat> once you see the Yang model, you will be able to navigate to any of the container, the Yang container, uh, through this REST API. So the, all the APIs will start with slash REST conf in the top, and then the Yang module name. So for example, if you're accessing the inventory, you'll be saying something like slash REST conf, slash inventory, slash nodes, and the node uh, detail. And uh, APIs, like any good uh, REST API needs to, will support both XML mapping and uh, JSON mapping. And these are defined by uh, RFCs, the, how the Yang gets mapped to uh, XML, or how the Yang gets mapped to JSON, is defined by the industry uh, standard RFCs, XML Yang and uh, JSON Yang. So um, if you're familiar with NetConf and Yang, any system that exposes NetConf uh, typically has two data stores, one for the configurational data and one for the runtime or operational view of the data. So in case of the controller, the configuration data store refers to anything that you might have set uh, from the northbound using the applications. And the operational data refers to whatever data a system has derived by fetching it from the network uh, elements. And you can access this using the different URL formats on the top, whether it is restconf config or restconf uh, operational. And subsequent format of the URL is about the same. Uh, so what does the URI for a given API looks like? Um, so at the top level, like I mentioned, you have to start with the module name. So if you can see the Yang file of the uh, system you are looking at, which you can uh, uh, kind of automatically download, by the way, and that first uh, element will always be the module name. And below that, it will be the container names as uh, specified in the Yang model. And so it can be either of the format node name or the module name colon node name. So this will be, be a little clearer as we see uh, the, some of the actual example uh, Yang models. Uh, so, so all the node names will be separated by a slash. And at the if the node represents a list as compared to a container, you will need to provide the key of the list. So for example, uh, let's say you were accessing a uh, inventory nodes. The URL will be something like slash inventory, slash nodes. Then you have to give the key of the node, like whether node 1 or node 100. And then slash, then let's say you are looking at the interfaces. It will be slash interfaces, then the actual interface ID, and then the actual detail what you might be looking at. Uh, of course, to make any API call, the first thing you need to know 
is how to authenticate your application to the system. So OpenHDN controller, again, I mean, I want to reiterate that this is the same in open daylight. API-wise, open daylight and open HDN controller are compatible. Uh, you need to first get a token. So, uh, so how you do you get the token? So you make a request to the controller auth endpoint, and you supply your uh, username and password. You will get a token uh, in response, and you will need to pass that token in all the subsequent uh, API requests. So here is just kind of a sample, uh, say, JavaScript uh, fragment that shows how you might be able to extract the token from the response body. Uh, so you extract it, and you could set it as a global variable, and then you pass it in all the subsequent requests. OK, so um, what APIs are uh, included in OpenSDN controller? So some of these are standard modules uh, available uh, kind of out of the box. So that is uh, OpenFlow, BGP, and uh, PCEP, and uh, of course, kind of inventory and uh, topology. OpenFlow, there are two different ways of uh, programming the OpenFlow. Either you could directly program to the OpenFlow plugin, assuming you're a little bit more familiar with the OpenFlow protocol and you want to directly deal with the plugin, you could do that. Or you could simply work with your inventory uh, and update the data in the inventory, and the system will automatically push those flows uh, to the network elements. And like I um, was saying before, the system is extensible. So if you develop an additional uh, plugin and add that to the system, any API that is part of that plugin will also be automatically be made available through RESTConf. And as a plugin author, you don't need to do any extra work for uh, doing that. Uh, that's the automatically exposed via RESTConf, NETConf, Java APIs, et cetera. In addition, a key capability is that if you're working with a NETCONF-capable uh, network element like an ASR9K or a XRVR, when you connect that to the controller, it gets mounted onto the controller, very similar to how a uh, file system mount works. Once this connection is established, any APIs, NETCONF, or the models available from that NETCONF device also get automatically become available, again, to RESTCONF and NETCONF from the controller. So what this means is that the controller could be dynamically, at runtime, learning about new devices. So there is nothing hard-coded about it. Let's say whether it's a, a Juniper device or another third-party device. If it is NetConf capable, the con you will be able to connect to it, and you'll be able to invoke any of those APIs from the controller. Okay, let's uh, go a little deeper into what some of the typical uh, APIs look like. So this shows the inventory API. And like I was saying, what I'm really showing here is the Yang model. But from that, you can derive the API. So like I was saying here earlier, the module name here is Open Daylight Inventory. And below that, you will see a container called Nodes, for example. Below that, there is an L L uh, list of nodes, and then uh, node connector. So node represents, say, a network element. A node connector might represent a interface or a port. Uh, so to access, let's say, for example, uh, say, node 100, you might use a URL, something like slash uh, restconf, slash operational, the module name, which is open daylight inventory, nodes, which is the container name, and then the name of the list, node, and below that, uh, the node ID. Like I was saying, whenever you use a list, you have to give which ID you are referring to. So node 1 or node 100, whatever the key for that uh, list is. And then you can uh, fetch uh, all the details at that level, or you can access a specific uh, interface, for example. Again, uh, the node connector. So that's one example. What is shown on the right? are more about uh, notifications from the system. So when the inventory changes, 
you could be getting uh, notifications like a port got attached or a port got uh, detached. You could get uh, notifications. So the model is showing uh, that as well. Uh, similarly, the topology model. So again, these models are actually happen to be IETF uh, standard models, which the Open Daylight adopts. So any topology that you look at, whether it is uh, open flow topology or BGP topology or PCEP topology, all of them will look very, very similar. So that's the base uh, description of the topology. So again, very similar. Network topology is the module name here. And then uh, below that, you have a container called network topology. Below that, have a list of topologies. So a system, at the same time, could be carrying multiple different topologies. So you could look at, it, say, the open flow topology, or you could look at the BGP topology. So those will simply be in the list. And uh, a given topology can have a topology type, whether it is the overlay topology or underlay topology, et cetera. There is also a notion of tracking multi-layer topologies. So for example, uh, let's say you have a overlay network and which is supported by a physical network underneath. So in the system, you could represent what is the overlay net nodes and what does it correspond to in the underlay. So for this underlay topology and over that link represents that link between the overlay and underlay. At each node level, so for example, at the node, you will have a notion of a supporting node. That might be pointing to the actual uh, physical node underneath. So that represents the nodes or the endpoints in the gra topology graph. And then you have a list of links. And a link will have a source and a destination. So as you can imagine, this shows uh, what the, a topology graph will look like. A list of nodes and a list of links. And links contain the source and the destination, which are the nodes in the topology. So that's how you would be able to fetch uh, the topology. And you will see an example of this later when I show the demo. Uh, going a little bit uh, deeper, it might be a little harder to read uh, here um, the open flow topology uh, and how the open flow system works. So the open flow model gets augments the inventory. So you'll be able to access any open flow capable node uh, by simply accessing the inventory. So if, uh, say, a given node, node 10, ha is open flow capable, when you access that node, you will get extra information about the open flow tables. And under the open flow tables, you will have access to the flows. And the flows will have uh, the match and the action, et cetera. So when you want to program a flow, you can simply add to this list in the container. So you access the particular table and you access the particular flow, and you update that flow, or uh, upload a new flow, add to the list, the system will take care of automatically pushing it to the, down to the network element. And uh, as an application, when you want to push the flow, you can push to the config data store, like I was saying earlier. And when you want to check what's in the system, or what's in the actual network, you can fetch the operational data store, and you can see those uh, flows. Uh, a little bit of uh, more uh, detail uh, of a, what a given flow looks like. So a given flow, as you would uh, imagine, a open flow flow is about matching a certain incoming packet and invoking a certain action. So you will uh, see that uh, the match uh, uh, part which you can match it to very different uh, layers, like you can do a L2 match or a L3 match. And then you can uh, specify any action you want, like say forwarding the packet or uh, sending the packet back to the controller, uh, et cetera. OK. So here, uh, a sample uh, uh, API, for example. So this sample is showing uh, how to uh, do a uh, L2 flow, for example. So if you look at it, for example, uh, here the match, it's showing a Ethernet match for a particular uh, MAC address. Uh, and then uh, it's applying an action. Uh, 
So the, uh, on the left side, you will see that uh, the format of the URL, like I was saying uh, earlier. So you will, since you are applying a flow, it will be the config data store. And under that, you are seeing the module name, Open Daylight Inventory Nodes. Under that, the node. So the node ID happens to be OpenFlow colon 1 in this case. And then you are modifying table 0. And within table 0, you are creating a new flow, flow 1. And so this is the payload, which happens to be in XML in this case. It could be JSON as well, of course. And uh, so this particular uh, flow, uh, if it uh, the match goes through, and it basically sends it to port 2. So that's a, just a simple uh, L2 flow. Uh, similarly, I will show one uh, example of, say, an L3 flow. So L3 flow might be matching an IP address instead of a MAC address. And uh, so in this case, it's matching a, this uh, particular IP, 10.0.10.24, uh, like matching a subnet, actually, uh, and then uh, sending it to port 1. Again, the URL format looks very similar. The, only the payload will be a little different. So in the payload, uh, the match, it's uh, shown the IP address, the subnet match, and the instructions. Again, very similar, the action, the output action, and uh, it's, it's sending it to port 1 instead of port 2. So that's the only difference. Uh, so you might be wondering, kind of with all these APIs automatically derived from the model, how would you kind of you know, remember uh, all these APIs? And how would we, for, if the system is extensible, how will we keep the documentation uh, up to date. So the good news is that the, all this API documentation can get auto-generated. So that's another benefit of the model-driven system. In addition to generating the actual APIs, whether it's REST con for Java APIs, the system can automatically generate the documentation as well. So we'll be uh, drilling um, through this uh, in the example. So this tool called the API Explorer allows you to list all the modules, and you can drill down into each of the modules to find out what APIs are available. And then uh, you can even actually try out the APIs with the sample uh, input. Uh, you can uh, try out the API, see what the response looks like. At that point, you get the API URI and all the payload that you need, which you can easily then copy and use it in your application. So that's a very um, nice tool for you to browse the APIs interactively before you can code them in your application. Um, I'm not going to cover uh, too much about the Java APIs, but at a high level, you might choose to kind of, you know, uh, do some Java-based development for various reasons. One could be for uh, higher performance, for example, if your application is going to interact with the network a lot or some other uh, plugins in the system a lot, you might choose to write in a Java API. Of course, that has a steeper learning curve, so that will be a trade-off between uh, writing an application using REST or writing uh, the Java API. Once you write the Java uh, API, so all the uh, APIs are available for listening to any other plugin in the system or implementing a certain interface uh, that your plugin can expose to other plugins. So of the list of all the available APIs is uh, published on DevNet. So like I was uh, saying, uh, kind of when you might choose to develop using, say, the Java API as compared to, say, the REST API, right? Uh, Java APIs are designed for uh, performance because you don't go through the serialization and the deserialization uh, overhead in the system. Also, uh, <clears throat> like I was saying, the model gets a little more uh, uh, complex uh, for kind of the programming model, so you need to be really comfortable with uh, 
Java programming and various other uh, technologies which I will uh, cover because the programming model could be asynchronous, the programming uh, could be multi-threaded, etc. But if you are comfortable with that, they can provide you a lot of uh, power. And you can ship your uh, applications or the network, the plugins, as uh, Kara features, which uh, <coughs> can be kind of dynamically loaded into any other uh, instance of the controller. So what are the tools uh, you need um, to do the uh, development in uh, Java? So Yang, like I mentioned, is the modeling language. Uh, if you're uh, not familiar with Yang, there are actually other sessions at uh, Cisco Live. I'll be showing kind of the list at the end, which, can give, which will give you the tutorial on uh, NetConf and Yang, et cetera. So anyway, the Yang is used uh, as the interface description. So your plugin, whatever methods it exposes for other plugins, they will be described in Yang. Any notifications the system generates, those are also described as Yang notifications. And any data that uh, is made available by your plugin also need described as uh, Yang. So in the programming language, as you would expect, of course, is uh, Java. Maven is the build tool where you uh, describe the dependencies, uh, kind of what your plugin uh, has on other plugins, etc. And uh, OSGI is the container mechanism. So this is how the controller keeps uh, one plugin from uh, interfering with another plugin, for example. So if you, uh, for example, import a certain Java library, but it, that might conflict with another uh, library that's written by some other plugin. So the Caraf, uh, the OSGI container, allows you to keep that separate and uh, keep it modular. Uh, and uh, so Caraf is the technology used by Open Daylight for uh, managing this. Uh, so uh, the Caraf uh, container, so this is kind of uh, what it might look like. So for example, if a plugin A and uh, plugin B both depend on a plugin C, the system will automatically manage those dependencies and it will load the necessary plugins uh, automatically. And the Caraf container gives certain benefits to the system. So for example, at runtime, without bringing down the system, you could be loading additional uh, features into the system. So that is the hot deployment. You can also access the system uh, through SSH uh, remotely, and you can look at things like which plugins are loaded, which uh, plugins uh, are, uh, uh, do they depend on, which plugins are available for loading, et cetera. Uh, and uh, any component, if you can write it in uh, Java, then you can wrap it as a OSGI plugin and uh, load it to the controller. Uh, so the process looks uh, something like this. Uh, you will be starting with your Yang model, and uh, then you run it through the tooling that's available in the system. That automatically generates uh, a bunch of basically Java files, the Java interfaces for you. And then as the plugin developer, you get to implement those Java interfaces. So for example, if you defined a uh, Yang RPC called, uh, say, uh, add a flow, the Java corresponding Java interface gets generated, and you get to uh, implement the Java uh, implementation of that interface. And uh, the Maven uh, system and the, the tools provided by Open Daylight community make it very easy to uh, do all the packaging, etc., automatically for you. So by kind of with one command line tool, you can generate a skeleton of the application, and you just need to fill in the details. Uh, so then uh, the last step in the process is to define what other bundles or features that your uh, module might be dependent on. So that is the Caraf feature file. So once you kind of assemble all this the, using the Maven uh, build system, that generates a car file. 
So that is the unit of deployment. That's basically a feature archive. Uh, so then at that point, you can uh, send, give it to someone else, or anybody can load it into the controller. OK, uh, at this point, I'll uh, switch over and uh, show a few uh, demos of what the APIs look like. So this, um, for example, is uh, the kind of what the OpenHDN controller, the main uh, dashboard uh, looks like. So you have the uh, the <clears throat> the some of the applications which are uh, bundled as part of OpenHDN controller. So you have the uh, BGPLS manager, which in my case actually I have not uh, loaded it here, so it's going to be empty. Uh, I have a few open flow switches uh, connected to this, so you are seeing the open flow inventory. This uh, shows all the Yang modules available uh, in the system. Uh, this is the open flow manager application uh, using which uh, you can uh, uh, easily do some uh, flow programming. I'm not going to cover this because the focus is more on uh, showing what the APIs looks like. I just wanted to give a quick uh, overview of what the controller looks like. So let's access the available APIs, like I was saying earlier. So the so this um, shows all the available APIs. And uh, as I mentioned uh, exam uh, earlier, right, the system is very dynamic. You might be wondering what that car people and car purchase might be doing here, which has nothing to do with the networking. So that shows the dynamic extensibility of the system. So I had developed a test plugin for just testing the system called car uh, plugin. And that has been loaded into the system. And now you automatically have the corresponding uh, REST APIs uh, in the system. So for example, you could uh, add a new car to the system or modify a car to the system. So that just shows the, that the system is uh, extensible. So let's uh, uh, access one of the uh, APIs, for example, say the open daylight inventory. So this shows um, all the available uh, nodes in the system. Like I was saying earlier, the, there is a config data store uh, and a operational data store. So in this case, let's look at the operational data store where you can only do a get, because it does not make any sense to go and update the operational uh, inventory. Operational inventory shows what's in the network. So it's a reflection of what's in the network. So all you can do from an API point of view is look at what's available. So this shows um, the URL format, of course, is right here. And uh, to make this API call, there's, you don't need to supply any argument, because since you just need to fetch the inventory. So if I try it out, OK, so here it is. So here you are seeing, um, uh, so the, uh, the response came back. And what you saw earlier, as in the graphical uh, UI, it, the same information is coming back in this API response. The, our user interface actually uses the exact same uh, APIs. So you will see here, for example, the nodes uh, is the list of nodes. And within that, we are seeing the open flow node, for example. And say within that, uh, we'll see the, uh, the multiple the st table statistics or the flow statistics, and any available uh, flows in the system. Uh, instead of, say, getting the JSON data, if you wanted to get the result in, say, for example, application XML, you can try it out. OK. So now you are get, got the same data back in uh, XML format. So that makes it kind of very easy. So if you wanted to try out your uh, uh, API, uh, so you can uh, try either way, uh, XML or JSON, and then copy that to your application. 
Uh, you can look at uh, some other uh, APIs here, for example. Say, for example, the network uh, topology. Uh, let me look at uh, what is in the config topology. OK, so the config topology is actually empty because I have not actually created any particular uh, topology in the config data store because I'm calling the APIs for the first time. So let me uh, get the operational topology. Uh, here. OK. Um, so here, again, you got the topology information. Like I was uh, saying earlier, topology information basically consists of, it's always the same format, the module name on the top, the container, then the topology types, and then an ID for the topology, and then a list of links with the source and destination, like I was saying, and a list of nodes. So if I go here, this essentially corresponds to the same information. So each of these are the nodes and the links. You will get the exact same information uh, back. So this API Explorer is one way of getting the documentation. So if I, uh, like I was saying, this can be dynamic. So in any running controller, you could have a different set of APIs uh, available. And here, on the right side, right now I, my system will not have anything because I do not have any netconf capable system uh, connected. But if I were to connect uh, any netconf capable system, all those APIs will uh, be available here. Uh, so the, this just this one uh, item is available. That's actually the controller itself, which also happens to be a netconf capable system, because I was saying earlier, uh, controller exposes both netconf and restconf in the northbound. So you can access the controller's own data using, uh, the, using this link. So the configuration data, like for example, which modules are loaded, which modules uh, depend on which other modules, et cetera, that kind of detail can be accessed uh, using this link. So just to remind you, like I was saying earlier, this link is accessible from the top left uh, in the dashboard. In, uh, if you were to use uh, open daylight, same information is available, but this pretty dashboard will not be available. But uh, this top level link of accessing a particular uh, the documentation, that is the same. Uh, let me also show uh, similar information how to do it uh, using, say, for example, Postman. Uh, I'll just show uh, two examples. So this, for example, uh, I was saying earlier, if, before you can make any API call, you need to get the authentication token. So this uh, here uh, is the API request to get the token. So you need to pass the username, which is admin in this case, and the password. And if I execute this request, I'll get um, a new token. So here. So this is the new token. And I had mentioned earlier how I can extract uh, the token from that response. So what this is doing here is that it's extracting that token, and it is storing it in a global variable for all the subsequent requests to use. So if I see here, for example, so it's, uh, this is the host information uh, that uh, I put. And all the token and the authorization information is also available. So when I make another API call here, so for example, get config topology, it's going to use the host global variable. And if we see here, uh, the, I'm sending the data in JSON. I'm accepting the data in JSON. 
and I will be passing the token that I got from the earlier API call. So if I get this, so, for, um, so the response came back. Like I was saying, the only thing in the this topology uh, is the, in the config topology, is the about the controller itself. On the other hand, if we get the operational topology, so we should be getting all the open flow nodes. Again, the request format is very similar, uh, and the same authorization header. So let's send this request. So here, uh, all the uh, open flow information uh, came back. So the open flow, the, all the nodes, so you, we should be have uh, six or seven nodes that I have in the topology. So this uh, kind of shows how to make the open flow API uh, calls. But uh, uh, so you can uh, get the URL formats uh, from the RESTConf API documentation, and uh, you can try it out using the Postman tool. Coming back to the presentation. OK. Um, so um, <coughs> OpenHDN controller um, is a very developer-focused uh, product because the prime target audience are the various developers and the ISVs. And a uh, lot of information is available in uh, DevNet um, uh, for, to help the developers. So the SDK documentation, and there are a lot of uh, samples, there are a lot of uh, videos. All of these you can access um, uh, from the developer DevNet uh, portal. And there is also interoperability testing. So yeah, if uh, you want to certify your, either the application or the uh, third party uh, plugin or a, the network element, there is a certification uh, program. And you can kind of go to the DevNet site to get the more uh, information about that. Uh, so this, uh, I'm just showing a snapshot uh, of the DevNet portal, where all the, like I said, the documentation, the API documentation, the samples, uh, and there's even a sandbox environment where you can uh, kind of bring up the, the controller and try out everything uh, that I showed you here today. And in fact, uh, the uh, right outside, in the uh, hands-on labs, uh, you can try out the OpenSDN controller as well. Uh, there are uh, many more uh, interesting you know, sessions uh, related to OpenSDN controller happening uh, throughout the week. Uh, I'll just highlight a few of them. Uh, for example, uh, in the world of solutions, uh, there is uh, a, uh, uh, an application developed by uh, the advanced, Cisco Advanced Services uh, that is being shown. And uh, like I mentioned, the hands-on lab, you can uh, try out SDN controller. If you want to uh, kind of learn some more about the RESTConf APIs, on uh, Wednesday, uh, Giles is uh, conducting kind of another uh, deep dive of the APIs, delving more into uh, BGP and uh, PSAP APIs, how to access the NetConf mounted APIs, et cetera. The, you might want to attend that. Uh, there is, I was mentioning um, earlier, uh, Yang model uh, overview. So if you're not uh, familiar with uh, Yang modeling, there is a session uh, tomorrow that you might want to attend. And uh, so likewise, there are kind of mul multiple uh, sessions uh, that you might want to check out. So with that, uh, let me kind of leave a little bit time for questions. Any questions? So my question is that, uh, let's say that a month from now, after Cisco Live, or a week from now after Cisco, Cisco Live, mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I get access to all these code sampling that you show us on here? Like, uh, how the, how do you get access to yeah. the system? I mean, like, all the code sampling, that, like uh, the API sampling code sample that, that you show us, 
how do I get access to that and review it? OK. Uh, so the question was, uh, how do we get access to all the samples and uh, API documentation? You can uh, get the samples. You can download the samples uh, from the DevNet uh, sandbox. Uh, not the sandbox, at the, from the DevNet portal. You can get access to all the APIs. Both uh, There are a whole bunch of uh, Python uh, samples which show how to access the REST API, and uh, Java samples which show how to develop the plugin. All of that can be accessed from the DevNet portal. This 24-7, right? Not like just for Cisco Live? Not, no, it's not just for Cisco Live. Even after that, the actual sandbox, there is a reservation mechanism. You can reserve it for, like, say, three hours, four hours, if you want to try out the system. Uh, but uh, the actual samples, of course, you can download and review it at your leisure. And uh, also, the other point I want to key point to mention uh, is that, of course, anything that you try out in open daylight should work uh, in open HDN controller as well. So that's another uh, avenue. You could just download the open source distribution as well and uh, see, kind of look at the kind of source for everything if you need to from uh, wiki.opendaylight.org. Any other questions? OK. Thank you very much.